Masueda Buanji. For those of you who aren't from Malawi, good evening. Um, so Angela and I hope to share some of our experiences tonight. Um, when I hit the next slide. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, in full disclosure, Angela and I have known each other for almost 30 years. We met in the Peace Corps, uh, and we've been doing this international development work ever since. So this was us in Kailan, Sierra Leone, where Angela came to visit me. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Kailan, Sierra Leone was in the news recently. It was the first and the worst to take the hit of the Ebola outbreak. So there we were 30 years ago. <laughs> so as an outline, uh, we've been discussing the changes that we've seen both in how aid uh, monies flow in international development and how the philosophy has changed over the years. So we want to go back and give you kind of a historical context um, so you can see what we do today and put it in perspective. Uh, so we're going to introduce you to USAID and uh, funding mechanisms for this type of work in Africa. Uh, then we're going to talk about food security and economic development, what it really means. Uh, then we'll share some experiences from uh, 30 years ago when we were in Peace Corps. Uh, and then some of the recent work that we've done in Kenya and Malawi, if we have time. And assuming that we get past that, we have what we put up here is thoughts and footnotes, which will really just be kind of exchanging with all of you, um, sharing stories that come up, and then open it up for questions. So why is aquaculture, what is food security and economic empowerment? Uh, what does all that mean? Well, to put it in context, I have a quote here from World Fish that says, in the developing world, more than one billion people obtain most of their animal protein from fish. And more than 800 million, again, almost a billion people depend on fishing and aquaculture for their livelihoods. So that really speaks to both food security and economic empowerment. So from a historical perspective, USAID is the lead organization for um, dispersing international development funds. Uh, it was originally created in 1961. It was an initiative by President Kennedy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through kind of how it's evolved over the first 50 years of its existence. So in the 60s, it was really created as kind of a Cold War mechanism where the philosophy behind it was we would go over and engage with people overseas and show them how superior capitalism is to communism. And so the original projects were to really engage these people and show how powerful we were. So the big projects focused on infrastructure, such as building airports and bridges and highways. And they were really big projects, very costly. Then in the 70s, there was more of a shift to the basic human needs. So food, nutrition, health education, human resources development. How can we empower people? Now this is at a time where there were uh, a lot of famines going on. Uh, also it was a time where, particularly in Africa, there was a sense that there was uh, an anti-American feeling. Um, 70s, you know, the African National Congress and that, it was a very tenuous time. The Peace Corps was created in the 60s, and the Peace Corps and USAID have worked very closely on development projects. And I can't say that they go exactly hand in hand, but it was kind of a two-pronged process where we would show our economic power, and then on the other hand, get Americans in there to engage with folks and show them that we aren't just the ugly Americans, that we do have a moral capacity toward, to us. Humanitarian. Humanitarian, okay, whatever. And then in the 80s, uh, it shifted again and it was turned to markets. There was a lot of private sector development. I know in Sierra Leone, where I was at, they had established these rural banks where farmers could come and uh, get loans to be able to expand or to get their products to market. Uh, and that was a USAID funded 
uh, thing. And then there was, a, again, a shift back towards agriculture, away from the big infrastructure projects towards agriculture. Again, as times, you know, as times change, there was a shift again to sustainability and democracy. Um, where the focus had been in agriculture on single commodities and increasing productivity, there was a realization that, well, it's fine to grow these things, but can we get them to market? Can we get them to people who need them? How do we increase, you know, ec economically? How, how do we empower these people? And then there was a greater reliance on non-governmental organizations because they have the infrastructure and the ability to get out and reach people better than a big cumbersome agency. Uh, again, in the 2000s, a lot of this had to do with uh, um, particularly, you know, mid 2000s and such, the events that had evolved after 9-11 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Again, there was another shift. Um, and also, the budget for USAID really shrank. And so there was a sense that there wasn't enough money and that we could make things more efficient by going to the use of contracts and grants, which is what we use today. And uh, there was a big focus on food security, which is what Angela's going to talk about to a great degree here in a little while. In 2010, the president uh, started an initiative. It was one of his three big initiatives that he's done in global outreach. And it was called Feed the Future. The other two were global climate change and uh, global health. Uh, so in the 2010 presidential initiative, he has not just, not just our own investment here in the US, but he's brought in the global community to fight global hunger and to increase food security. Um, the focus now is on small holders, small farm holders, particularly women. So in the philosophy of USAID, you'll see this again and again. There's a lot of empowerment of women. So what was the purpose? The purpose then was to develop agricultural sectors, to increase economic growth, right? Give people the money that they need so that they can make their lives better, uh, provide them employment, give people the means by which they can support themselves. And so in assessing this food initiative, uh, last year they did a study and they wanted to see um, how well this has really helped. And we see that in Kenya in particular, where there's a big problem with stunting due to malnutrition, uh, that's reduced the prevalence of malnutrition for children under the age of five by 20%, which is really astonishing. So I don't want to dwell on this too much, um, but we're talking about aquaculture in particular, and USAID is the lead or government organization for Feed the Future. So I want to talk about, in terms of agriculture and aquaculture, there's two major funding mechanisms. And one is the, what we call the CRSP program, which is the Collaborative Research Support Program which is geared more towards research, exchange of scientists and ideas, and actually building the capacity of folks overseas, giving them the tools and the knowledge. And the other is one that Angela and I are involved in, which is called the Farmer to Farmer Program, which really works through non-governmental organizations and relies on volunteers to do the work. It's more extension and advisory. So, here, now I've, exchanged, I've expanded the Farmer to Farmer program. Uh, I think it was in 2004 they changed the name. So for those of you that don't know, John Oganowski was one of the pilots uh, that was on the plane that hit one of the towers on 9-11. And so they wanted to dedicate this program to him because he had spent his whole life um, being an activist and volunteer. Um, so he was very well known for that. And Doug B. Reuter was the congressman who established the program. So since we rely heavily on volunteers, what, what is the role of the volunteer? I'm going to read it straight out because I can't say it any better than that. But it's to utilize transfer technology and management expertise, which the two of us embody, 
to link farmers with markets using advantages in production, processing, and marketing. Um, so these are the groups that they, that they reach out to, smallholder farmers, uh, agricultural extension agents that can go out and help people. Um, but more than just agriculture, I think here in this country anyways, we kind of divorce agriculture and aquaculture from having the money to do it. So it also uh, is to work with financial institutions to, to get microfinancing for folks. So the idea is to develop specific market chain, market value chains. And here on the right, there's an example uh, from in Malawi. There's three very big uh, value chains there. You have soy, groundnut, or peanuts, uh, as well as vegetables. But you see, if you take a look at the focus areas, there's much more than just agriculture involved. There's uh, natural resource management, producer organization development. So those cooperatives and, and collaboratives, uh, there's uh, programs in place to, to bring those folks together and teach them how to work as a unit. Uh, marketing and processing and again, financial uh, services. Okay. So in assessing how the program, the program was established uh, the original Farmer to Farmer was established in 1985. So in assessing and how well they've done, since that time, they've reached about 1.2 million farmer families. And for statistically, they estimate that there's five people per family. So you're looking at about six million people, families. Now with that, there's other services and stuff that directly affect people. So they, they feel that this program has reached 47 million people. So, Angela and I have both worked with uh, Aquaculture Without Frontiers, the one up in the left-hand corner. Aquaculture Without Frontiers is a, is a volunteer-based organization. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization. Vega, Volunteers for Economic Growth Alliance, is an alliance of a number of different of these same types of organizations with like-minded um, values. And so I put this up here because if you take a closer look at a lot of these, it's not just about agriculture and aquaculture, but these reach a bunch of different sectors. There's engineers, there's economists, there's one of them is a um, credit, uh, an association of credit unions that works on microfinancing, getting money for folks. It allows us to partner with all these people to attack the problem from many different angles. In terms of the Farmer to Farmer program, USAID has identified these organizations here to be core implementers, which means these are the only ones that the money flows through to be able to do these. And I put this up here because Angela and I have both worked with CNFA and Vega. Vega, we worked with Aquaculture Without Frontiers, and you'll hear some of the stories about that. And then also CNFA, which is Cultivating New Frontiers in Agriculture. <laughs> Your turn. Thanks. <laughs> so now he got through all the PhD stuff, right? So we're going to just talk about the dirt. We're going to get down into the, onto the ground. And part of our presentation is about food security. It's one of the number one concerns right now um, in global economy. So I'm going to ask people, you know, what's, it's a com very complex issue, and there's been debates everywhere about what does that mean? So when I say food security, I want a bunch of people to just yell out what that means to them. What do they think of when they hear food security? Having enough to eat. Reliable sources. Having enough to eat. Nutrition. Sustainability. There's a lot of things, and we all have our own different idea of what it means. But really what it is is health through nutrition or malnutrition. I mean, that's how the basis of what we're trying to accomplish is to minimize malnutrition and make people reliable on their own resources to make food available at an economic price point that they can afford. So it's about the health. It's about the sustainable economic development. It's about the environment. We can have a lot of food available, but at what environmental cost does that happen? 
Um, and trade. We are a global economy. So these things have been debated. Everybody has their own de definition. And we're going to go through some of those issues. latter part of that slide will break down a little bit more. So let's talk about fish and food security, <clears throat> since we're kind of fish heads. So we'll get this. Just to give you some stats, 90% of the fish eaten in the US is imported. Okay, did, anybody, did everybody know that? OK. 70% of that is farm raised, which could be a little bit higher by now. OK. Um, little stats that they hate me talking about at the Kentucky Department of Agriculture is that aquaculture worldwide has surpassed beef production in 2012. Worldwide. We are growing more fish than we have cattle in the world. Not a bad thing. In the US, it is third accountable for the deficit. We're only third to oil, imports, and cars. And that might have even shifted with the oil issues now. So it's a huge global concern. What about our population growth? We're going to double in population by 2050. Mark Twain said it best, by land, God's not making any more. So how do we make that more efficient? How do we squeeze as much out of it as we can without paying the price of degrading the environment and our own personal health. And then pollution. There's always going to be a trade-off. How do we make sure that we don't add to any further pollution while we're trying to feed these people? Andrew. So, yes, sir. You know those uh, commercials with the, chick, uh, the cows walking around eat chicken? Yeah. Should they be saying eat fish? <laughs> right, right. Wouldn't that be awesome? They'll get cows in, whatever. Um, it is a great campaign. And that's one of the things, you know, not to hop on any of the other commodities because we all are, you know, we eat, sleep, and breathe food, right? Food is the global economy. It's, it's the thing we do at celebrations. It's the thing we celebrate. We share with people. It's the most common form of communication. You cannot speak one language, one word of a language, but somebody can offer you something to eat, and you have that natural bond. Africa is very prevalent in that. Look how big that continent is. It's huge. How are we going to make sure that people are going to be able to survive and develop with the right protein sources to develop that brain, to help those kids not die 50% of them by the age of five because of malnutrition. So those are the issues that we're, we're dealing with. And we think that aquaculture can surely help relieve some of those problems. OK, so what's your definition of food security? We already went through. Well, the World Food Summit says when all the people at all the times have access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life, that's the golden parachute. That's what we would all strive for. Do we have it now? Absolutely not. Shame on us. But another one, both physical and economic access to food that meets people's dietary needs, as well as their food preference. We talked about this. One of the things in Peace Corps, which was a big joke, I was a third year volunteer. We did three years was the joke that a first year volunteer would get a piece of bread and go, oh, there's ants, and not eat it. A second year volunteer would go, eh, there's some ants, and eat it. A third year volunteer would go, yay, ants. <laughs> so it's all relative about the preference. Fish are historically and notably the, most, the best conversion factors. They can take 1.2, 1.5 pounds of feed to make a pound of growth. The only species on Earth that are better and more efficient at that are bugs. And we're not there yet. Are we? Not yet. Not yet. We're working on it. However, cricket meal last week at Trader Joe's was $50 a pound. And there's a market for it. It's high protein, efficient. We're working on it. Okay. So Marty and I did some work in, Ken in Kenya. Um, I put this slide up just to show where we were. We were kind of did some work in Eldoret, OK? Big city, 
big city, not as big as Nairobi, and some work down on the coast in, in, uh, outside of Malindi. Okay, so when we say markets, what comes into your head when you think the word market? Okay, this is our American market. Okay, fruits, vegetables, beautiful, grade A. You know, how many choices of bacon do we really need? And yogurt. This is a typical market where we were in Eldorado. And that's a major capital city. Okay, that's the market that we have to deal with. This is the fish section of the market. Let's talk about food security. What about nutrition and safety? We're a global economy. Where's the food coming from? So this fish, here's your ready to eat meal. Take it home and feed it to your kids. It's not that nice little clear container of meatloaf you get at the Kroger Deli. Okay, that's your ready to eat meal. Okay. Um, put a fish on a stick and you got a market, right? Squish the guts out and you got a processed fish. That wouldn't fly in the U.S. and wouldn't fly in most of Europe or developing country. Now, one thing that is notable about these fish, how big they are, these are all wild caught from Lake well, what? Victoria. Victoria, thank you. <laughs> now, you're going to explain why. This is an issue. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the issues that we found out when we got to the market here, uh, you know, they, they've asked us to come in and help establish aquaculture, help grow the sector there. And the, and the big reason is well, these fish for there look beautiful and everything. Lake Victoria is being overfished. It's severely on decline. The, the fishery is about to collapse. But the bigger issue for the people in Kenya is that there are three countries that border Lake Victoria, Kenya being one of them. Kenya has a small section of it. But the prevailing winds are such that the floating plants that are on the lake are pushed up against their shore. And they're so, because of the pollution in the lake, it's so overgrown that they can't get their boats out into the sea anymore. And so they are 100% reliant on imports from the other two countries that are on, on the lake. And they do have political squabbling sometimes. They shut down the border and they can't, they can't get access to the fish. So that's a, that's a very big food security issue. So it's an environmental issue because we have pollution. It's a natural issue because all these plants are choking up the waterways for the local fish. And it's also a political issue, right? Food is pretty, pretty political. Again, ready-to-made meal. That one's fried. The other one was baked. But there you have it. That's the market. That's the fish portion of that market. Now, here's where they go when they're cleaned. Would I want to eat that fish? I find no safety in that fish at all. Now, don't forget, those people have been eating these microbes for years. They probably would not have an issue with something that might be on some of those fish. However... This is Kenya. It's on the other side of Masamara. There's tons of tourists that go through there. And I don't think Kenya's economic tourism would really want people getting sick eating fish like this. This is a hand washing station. It's kind of cool. I took a picture of this because if you look at the chimney, you can actually put some coals down there and you get hot water. Quite a development. Okay. Food safety is a real issue. Refrigeration. This was at one of the most developed markets in the city square. There's no refrigeration. But they would have sold all those fish by the end of the day. We talked about preference and cultural differences and preferences. They do have a huge market of small dried fish, okay? Also being totally overfished by the lakes in the region. And if you look at some of the fish meal and behind that, it's being dried purely on a piece of burlap. There's winds, there's kids, there's, I mean, it it's a, can be a real safety and nutritious issue. But again, there's food available. This is the veggie section. There's no protein. Most of the people in this country see those 
documentaries of African kids. And they go, what's the problem? They all look so fat. That's not healthy. It's kwashiorkor. It's malnutrition from protein deficiency. It gives them the big distended bellies. That's not a healthy child. But most people don't realize that. They think they're screaming because they're in pain or they're now, most kids have never seen a white man with a big camera on their, on their neck filming them. So, of course, they are not happy. Anyway, these are some of the markets that were very well developed. Again, this isn't a huge capital city. Protein is available, beans, rice. But do they know how to complement them? Or do they just eat it seasonally when it's available? Those are some of the issues that we as volunteers take on. Beyond just fish, it's a whole encompassing cultural um, issue. Again, great markets. But the distance, the distance from Eldoret to get to any other major cities, or more importantly, out to the underlying cities, is pretty difficult. When this is your major route, this could be your major route to get something to market. How do you get down into that valley to make sure that you have available food? There's agriculture, it's beautiful agriculture. We couldn't decide if this was wheat or soybeans, but it's cultivated. So it's there, but where's it going? Is it being shipped out for fish feed or animal feed? Is it going into to being shipped to China for tofu? We don't know, but it's being, it's being cultivated. I'm going to talk, talk about a little distribution because that was one of the issues that was on that slide. And I love this slide because everybody has really clean cars and trucks. So the debate goes on about food security. Do we have enough food to feed everyone? Some people say the problem is distribution. Therefore, we have enough food, it's just getting it there. Do we have the future needs on what we can grow now? If so, we'd have to get really, really efficient at it. And is our food security is it paramount, or is it just not important? Because we'll get it from some other country. How many people eat tilapia from China? Right? Some good stuff, some not so good stuff. We got to know. We need to educate ourselves of what's available, what's not available. Some people don't eat farm-raised fish at all because they said it's not good. Well, I like to think I'm one of them, and I say it is good. And then our globalization. It can add to the poverty, and it can add to huge insecurity, in rural, especially in rural communities. So let's talk about distribution. We were on this truck. What did they spend? 20 minutes finding the perfect yes. rock? 45 minutes. <laughs> to find the perfect rock to jack the truck up, even though there was a jack on it. But that wasn't their way of dealing with it. Now, that little Masamara farmer, that is his way of distribution. He's going to walk his livestock to market. Okay. What's the level of production? There's some distribution for you. Can you see what that is? Goats tied to the roof of a lorry. Okay. It works. Gets in there. Efficient. Safe. What? Strapping kids to the roof. Strap those kids on there too. <laughs> or you just walk the whole flock, right? However we're going to do it, we need to get stuff to market. Okay. Global trade. This guy's not dealing with global trade. He'll be lucky if he gets a good price for some of that and is able to sell it. Again, that's a major road. How do we move stuff there? Well, obviously, somebody figured it out. He's getting it from A to B. And it's a long road. It's a long, long road to, to look at third world countries and making sure that their food security is going to be guaranteed, or at least try to be guaranteed. This road was a huge uh, commuter road from Nairobi to the Masamara. The agricultural products on this road were beautiful and very abundant. 
However, most of these mamas would sell everything they grew rather than feed their village or their family because that's where the market was. It's an issue. It's an education issue that we all have to deal with. Here's a good one. Food safety. Some nice slaughtered animals hanging in that nice, warm uh, butchery shop. Look, she sighed in her eyes. I'm sorry. But that's the way life is there. We can only do these volunteer programs to try and help them bring their level standards up. They don't want to be Americans. And we shouldn't push that on them. We've done not such a great job as Americans. But to help them realize where they can do better in their own culture. Here's our meat transport guy. Pretty safe. Here's our milk transport. Okay? No, that's milk. Mm hmm. And then there's beer. That's always a good thing. So we, as volunteers, go into these places and we don't just look at the fish aspects, we look at the whole community. And that's kind of where I think these projects need to go. Uh, it's stockyard, pretty good. I don't see the big trucks wailing them off to a food lot, but, and then some soybeans. Because it's all about distribution. It's all about population. It's all about empowerment. How do we get people to feel that they have the right to develop how they want and feed their families well and their communities? So now we're going to talk, we're going to digress a little bit. We're going to go back to when we were friends. Oh, I mean 30 years ago. When I was a volunteer in Zaire. I spent three years in Zaire, three plus years. And I can honestly say that they taught me way more than I ever taught them. And a lot of the projects I worked with, well, I'll just tell you the one story. When I went for my Peace Corps interview, the recruiter said, after this long 40-minute interview about questions and what I knew about aquaculture and what I knew about development and blah, 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 said, okay, here's the last question. If you walked into a village and all the villagers, all they wanted to do was put up a flagpole what would you do? And I said, well, I'd help him put up a flagpole, and I'd be talking about fish culture the whole time. And he said, when do you want to go? <laughs> so some of those programs that I was lucky enough to work with was I realized along, early on that when you talk about third world, how many people here were involved in PTA when the kids were in school? Okay, How many are members of the golf club course? Or you know, some kind of yoga studio, something. There's no memberships there. They don't have any group involvement. I used to call it the buffer system. There's nobody to talk to. You go into your field, you farm, you feed your family, and you try and survive. Okay? In Zaire, we were very successful in the fish program because Historically, the men had been hunters and gatherers. There wasn't any more wildlife. So what we did with the fish program was we gave them back the ability to feed their families protein. We gave them a method in which they could then become, re-become the providers. It was awesome. There was a lot of women, though, who did not want this white, educated woman to go down into the forest with their men. Okay. I'm not losing my man to that American. So the way around it was, lucky enough to be a woman working with predominantly men farmers, was I started a mama's group. And we empowered those women by teaching fish nutrition, fish farming, but also prenatal care, nutrition, health. It made them become members of an elite group of the wives of fish farmers. One of the other things I realized early on was don't let any of those fish farmers sell their own product. Because everybody in their family, it's community. Oh, Papa, I'm hungry. Give me some fish. Well, in those family structures, which is polygamous, you have to give them fish. So somebody in that organization, that fish farmers group, would sell the fish for whoever was harvesting. 
And then they really realized how much money they were making or historically had not been making and given it to family. So it worked out great. But those were some of the projects that were very successful in Zaire. But most of it, the base was to empower the people and especially the women. I'll keep it. Okay, I'll keep it. <laughs> um, one thing I'd like to add that you didn't really touch on. One reason that Angela was so successful as she was when she was there, and she was very good at in collecting these people into these groups and stuff. Those people are usually the more innovative, the ones who are willing to step outside the box. And she would identify people that she called champions. And so those people, in turn, would teach other people. So where they may not want to respond to Angela, or may not, Angela couldn't reach, these champions would. And so it just kind of builds on, that self, on itself. Sierra Leone. Oh, Sierra Leone, OK. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to do here is I have some photographs back from when we were building ponds. And I wanted to have you see the process, what it's really like, um, and some of the challenges that we meet. So the first thing that we would have to do is identify an area that was appropriate for raising fish. And then you go in and you burn the land, get all the vegetation that you can off of it. And what's remaining, we would go in there with machetes and cut it all by hand. So you have to clear that whole area by hand. There's no lawnmowers. There's no bush no hogs. Bulldozers. No, no bulldozers or anything. Then the ponds are dug by hand. And you have to remember, you're dealing with people who, in Sierra Leone anyways, the staple is rice there. So they feel that they need to be out in their rice fields all day to feed their family. They used to have this saying that every meal was rice. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, midnight snack, it didn't matter. And if you didn't get your rice that day, you hadn't eaten. You could consume a big roast, you could eat the whole cow. But they still said that they hadn't eaten because they didn't have their rice. So rice is very important. Uh, so here we've established some ponds. We see some uh, rice paddies next to it. We see some incoming water here, um, cane pipes for inflow. Uh, we had to build little aqueducts. And then you see uh, a compost pen there. So because they don't have access to fish feed to get the fish to grow, we would try to get them to encourage the natural plankton blooms inside the ponds. So we would use compost, uh, whether it was uh, grass cuttings or or kitchen scraps or goat leftovers manure. or goat manure, chicken manure, or whatever to encourage that. So you can see uh, we built quite a few ponds. It could take uh, weeks to months to build each one, knowing that you can't work on it you know, all day long. Also, it's very hot during the day, so they like to take long breaks, work in the morning, work in the evening. Drink some palm wine in the afternoon. Palm wine in the afternoon. One of the things that we did, because rice is so important to them, um, it was really hard to get them to give up land that they could be using to cultivate rice, to cultivate fish. They love fish there. Um, they don't have a lot of access to it. They do have a dry season. The creeks dry up. They don't have any fish. So we were trying to get them to be able to have this protein source year round. So what we convinced some of the more innovative ones to do was culture rice and fish together. And we tried a number of different methods um, to test and, and prove proof of concept. So here you see uh, kind of a hybrid fish and rice culture going on. Um, one of the things that I told at the previous lecture that I, I didn't tell here was um, I was stationed at, uh, there was the national fish, basically a fish hatchery. And it was established early on in the 70s with uh, Peace Corps volunteers and USAID money working together. A few years before that, uh, there was a Chinese contingency had come in, and they had dung, dug this uh, dirt aqueduct, kind of like what you saw there. And they were teaching them different methods in how to grow rice. Well, USAID and Peace Corps decided that they needed to do fish on the other side. Their thinking at the time was, we have a whole meal here. We have fish and rice. 
but there wasn't enough water. They couldn't transport enough water. So I think USAID came up with the money to build a dam and a concrete aqueduct uh, with some Chinese help. But then over the years, when there was no specific ownership, nobody was taking care of it, nobody knew whose responsibility it was, it kind of fell apart. So these are just some uh, pictures of what daily life is like. We saw somebody climbing the palm tree, whether it was to get palm wine or these palm kernels here. Palm oil is very important to the folks in Sierra Leone. Um, here we see people taking the, the palm kernels and pressing the oil out of it. Everything is cooked in palm oil. Uh, there's no transport. It's a head. There's no transport. They transport on their head. All their energy, all their fuel sources, wood. One day I saw somebody walking down the street who had their shoes on their head because if you wear them on your feet, they get dirty. And I just couldn't stop laughing. I thought, look, they wear their shoes on their head. I like the one <laughs> where in Kenya we went to the market and they had thousands of shoes out there. But there were no two shoes that were the same. <laughs> right. So you could buy you could buy right one and left one had to be different. Right, right. Building a house. Uh, here we're building building a house. I lived in a village that had uh, about a hundred people in it, four houses. So the village was getting bigger, building another house. They'd cobble these uh, this wood together and then pack it with mud, and that's how you made the house. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to tell a story. <clears throat> when uh, I had been there a couple months in Sierra Leone, I was living in my village, and there was a little boy there. He was about, probably about 10 years old. Very few people there could speak English, but he could because he went to the Catholic school. And so he wanted to better himself with his English. So he would come and talk with me, and we would chat. And after a few months, he says to me, it's one night, the sun's going down, and he says, what's your African name? And I said, I don't know what you mean. He said, oh, yeah, any time Peace Corps comes around here, and all white people were Peace Corps. He um, said, so any time Peace Corps come around, we give them a name. And I said, well, I don't have one. He says, I'll give you one. Your name is Raka. I said, oh, okay, that's great. What does it mean? And he said, oh, big and strong like you are. I said, okay, I like that. Yeah, I'll live with that. So from then on, every village that I went to to go talk to fish farmers, potential fish farmers, I'd go into the village and I'd introduce myself as Raka. And everybody would get a big smile on their face and there'd be lots of laughs and they're patting me on the back <laughs> and they'd bring food and everybody in the village would come and so we would just sit there and talk and you know, got quite a few farmers that way. Well, when I was done with my tour, I went traveling and I went to Israel um, with this, this friend of mine. And when he came back, I was buying her a Christmas present. And I went into a bookstore, and I saw this book on, uh, that takes place in Israel. And there was this Israeli kid, who lived, a Jewish kid, who lived in a Palestinian neighborhood. And he's describing his story, what it was like growing up, where all the Palestinian kids would throw rocks at him and call him Raka. And so I look at it, the translation means village idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I ran around for 18 months telling everybody I was a village idiot. <laughs> But it opened a lot of doors. <laughs> so this here, you, you, you build these relationships with people. Um, they're not just their, their greatest resource, but the, you just relationships that will last with you forever. This is my friend's wife, Mary, here. And the baby they named after me. So they call him Junior Martin. Now see where I was. I don't know if you caught that picture. Bear breasted. That's fine, as long as you don't show your knees. And here's some of the kids in the village. You know, they don't have little Game Boys or players or whatever. So they invent their own toys. So here they have a stick that they run behind and they push on the ground. And there's a, that little uh, grass blade that spins as they're running. Right. And to them, they, they'll do that for hours and hours every day. Uh, so what we thought we would do here, and I know we're kind of running a little bit late. But very quickly, we could run through uh, some of the work that we did in Kenya with Aquaculture Without Frontiers. This was two years ago. Both Angela and I went as a team on this trip. We had two different scopes of work. We went to two different places. Here we were at the University of Eldoret. There was our taxi. 
<laughs> There's the taxi queue. Um, the University of Eldoret was a little more advanced, so they have a fish culture station there where they do some research and, and teaching. Um, we talked about the two funding mechanisms from USAID, one being the CRSP. Well, they're the ones that built this research station here. So the first thing that they wanted us to do was an assessment of their program, how well we thought they were doing, give them some ideas of where they could do better. So we went out and we assessed their program. Here I thought we were going to have some surf and turf, because we have some, a cow about ready to fall in the water there, trying to get a drink. Uh, so you can see they had a number of ponds, various different sizes. This here is a hoppa. They would collect the little tiny baby fish in there, and then they hold them in here so that they could feed them. Uh, they didn't really know what to feed them, but they were doing the best that they could. And when they get a little bit bigger, they're not su as susceptible to the predators. Um, they can go ahead and stock them in the ponds. Or sell them. It's a good market. So the day after we arrived, we, we did that assessment the first day. The day after, they had scheduled to have a farmer's workshop. Um, so a field day, if you will. And that's the day that we got there, the vice chancellor decided that she wanted to come to the university. So she canceled all activities at the university the next day when we were scheduled to have the workshop. They canceled classes, sent all the kids home. Um, fortunately for us, the message didn't travel upland very far. And so we had six, about 60 farmers came and we spent all day with them, helping them with their questions and management strategies and such. So these are just a number of pictures of the folks. We had the hands at the, at the station do a demonstration on how to harvest fish. And there's a tilapia. Yep. How to sex fish. How to sex fish. Uh, big problem is uh, get too much reproduction. And so, you really need to know what's in your pond. The other thing that they wanted specifically here was they had, the feed there is very expensive and it's low quality. So they wanted to make their own feed. Um, they ended up, well, let me, I should tell about the program. In Kenya, they invested, yeah. it was some like tremendous. Nine million US dollars. Some tremendous amount of money. It was like 150 million. Was it? Kenyan shillings or something for a three-year program um, that was subsidized to increase so they could get more protein upland, uh, get some people employed. So in this subsidy, what the government did was they paid for three years the unemployed youth to dig the ponds for folks. Then they would go ahead and buy fingerlings for them to stock their ponds and then provide them feed. Well, after that three-year program was over, they had no training and they didn't have access to feed anymore. So they wanted to know what to feed them. Within that program, if there were enough farmers in a, in a cooperative working together, they were given some feed manufacturing equipment like this. So it took them over a year to figure out how to run the equipment, but they still didn't know what to put in it. They didn't know how to make the feed. So that was one of the things that they wanted us to come over and help them with. And within that, they we were having trouble getting from them, what kind of ingredients, what do you have here that you can use? They weren't putting any oil in it. Oil is a good energy source. There's nutrients in there that they need. So we went to the market, the big market, to find out what's available in the area. The other thing that we thought we would do, because the same mills that make feed for dogs and cats, and chickens and whatever, makes livestock livestock, makes fish feed. So we wanted to see, okay, who's making, what mills, are there some locally that can make feed for these guys? Okay. The second part of the project was um, down on the coast, or closer to the coast there, it was a project that was funded through a place called Coins of Kenya. Um, and there, we were there to assess valleys and look at areas that we could possibly put fish ponds it's a very, very drought-stricken area during the dry season. But during the rainy season, they do have these huge rains, but they had no way of really encapsulating that water and using it throughout the dry season. 
So part of what our goal was is to work with them and see what we could do. Now, Coins of Kenya was well funded through the Mormons. Um, it was a great program. They built schools, they built churches, they built clinics. Um, very successful program, but they didn't have a lot of integrated ag, and they still didn't have that protein um, capability. So they also had the skills training, skills training, woodworking, yeah. making bricks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, textiles, clothing. Yep. Yeah, it was so, it was a really well-rounded program. Just didn't have a lot of food. They did work with in this area was a lot of um, craftsmen, beautiful carvings, beautiful statues, and that so. We kind of identified these were thousands of people employed there, and you know they're getting shipped all over the world. So in our thoughts of distribution, the system might already be there to move some of these products around the area. So really looking at what systems were already available that we might be able to tap into to move some of these protein products around. Beautiful valleys, a lot of building materials, um, but again, the same thatch, roof, mud, stick houses, and not a lot of resources available for the family nutrition. Um, this guy, these guys did have some um, animal elevage, animal husbandry programs. We spent some time inoculating goats and sheep, um, milking them. They had a structured nutrition uh, experiment going with children where if they fed them goat's milk twice or three times a week in their daily porridge, could they see an increase in test scores? And it was pretty successful. They were seeing that. So that was pretty cool because it was a very well-designed experiment. Look at that goat. Doesn't that just make you happy? Such a cutie. Not me, the goat. Um, so that was a pretty successful, as you can see from the bottom of that pen, they would then take all the waste from the goats, everything would fall through and they'd use it for fertilizer. So it was a pretty good program. Um, we had a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. Here's the porridge part, just trying to cook it up for the kids. Um, that would inc include the milk subsidy um, for those kids. And it was pretty successful. The test scores were, I forget what the percentage was, but it was significant. Um, they do have cattle there, so they had, you know, again, animal husbandry and training for those people in the village. And it's funny, one of the biggest, well, a significant money maker at this center was they were a charging station. What amazed me is being in Zaire and then going back to Kenya so many years later was they totally skipped the landline thing. So you'd have these mamas in the villages, babies strapped to their back, talking on their cell phone. Okay? But not everybody has electricity. So the center figured out they could charge a small amount of money and be a charging station. Now, recently I just read an article that in Kenya, they are using text messaging to do fish farming modules, education. Send out a text, hey, feed, blah, blah, blah. So it's pretty cool We're using more technology. And they can alert people. As a farmer, you... <coughs> The less distance you have to move your fish, the better off you are. You can get everybody to come to you, so those farmers will text different people in different villages to let them know when they're actually harvesting. And then they get a flood of people and all your, all your products sold. So you become the market, which is awesome. But one of the great things in this area, too, was there are a lot of empowered women. Marty had mentioned that I like to coin them the champions, because they are the ones who will drive that economic engine. And it's, it's usually mamas. It's usually the mamas in the village. These groups had a chicken cooperative, egg cooperative. This is something they developed through extension where um, they used just boxes lined with charcoal. And they would water it. They would spray water it on it every day. And it would keep the eggs cool enough where they could hold them for up to three months. So without refrigeration. So little things like that and helping those people get that words out. Again, the chicken co-op, these mamas were great. They realized that through good animal husbandry, offering them water, supp supplemental feed, and also protecting them from predators, they could then become much more efficient and much more economically stable. So where she showed you those chickens there, if I can interject here, um, 
they they use it they employ a model there that's like I don't know if you all know Heifer International where they will they give people products so they might somebody applies to belong to this cooperative and they might start you with four chickens so you sign up you're approved you get your four chickens and then what you do is you go ahead and raise those and with the eggs you hatch out other chickens and then you pass them on to somebody else who gets uh, approved and so the, the program just keeps expanding. And then once you've met your obligation, everything else is yours. Really successful. One of the other things was they had some small ponds. Again, it was a dry area. How do we keep water as long as we can? And in some areas, they just didn't even have enough to wash or bathe. Or So one of the goals was to look at those areas and sequester that water when it was rainy season so they would have it throughout the dry season. Um, we also wanted to help mitigate, it was a high, very humid area, so there was a lot of malaria, a lot of mosquitoes. Um, secondarily, we could put some fish in there to help eat the mosquito larvae, so it would help combat all those, those health issues. Um, so here's a couple areas that they just dug to hold water. And that, I might, I hate to say it, but goats and kids drank out of that same water. So. Now, we, one of our projects was, <laughs> you saw some of the ponds that Marty built in Sierra Leone and, and were also available in Kenya on the fish station. In this area, somebody came and told them that this was the right way to build a fish pond. Okay, Good information, the principle was right, but the actual technology was totally off. Um, and cover it with weeds so this, the fish are, have something to hide under. Well. You don't have oxygen in water that doesn't have any plankton or sunlight yet to photosynthesis. So we thought we'd help them harvest this pond. Well, we were told we were going to help them harvest yes. the pond. So we got in and we were told that fish are very clever. Yes, fish are very clever because they can avoid the net. And that's why we didn't catch any fish in this pond because they're so clever. And mind you, there's 150 people watching us do this. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, it was pretty sad, but I think we were able to help them learn a different methodology that would be much more efficient and much more. Uh, again, there's those women. It was the mommies group that had those ponds, and by empowering them, we can, we can help things change there. Because they do the farming, they're in charge of all the food, okay, and they make most of the financial decisions day to day. The men will let you think that they make them, not the case. And let's face it, if mom is not happy, nobody's happy. So, polygamous society though, maybe they'll just go get another one, but we won't mention that. Um, some of the other things they, that we tried to help them is some supplemental income or another business. Can you cook some fish on the side or do something else to help with that protein supply in the area, but also make some money and get those proteins out into the smaller villages. So here's some dried fish, and before that was some cooked fish. This picture I love because everybody has a baby on their back. Those babies are what's, what's important. We need to help get protein outs for that brain development and that good growth and nutrition. Um, school kids, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Oh. Awesome. Well, we went to visit the school. They were all thrilled. We were, they were the uh, group. There's a part of this that's called self-reliant ag agriculture mm -hmm. um, that's kind of funded through the Mormon church, as mm -hmm. Angela was saying. But some of the higher-up people came to visit while we were there. And I'll let you tell them that's <laughs> one story. But we spent the whole day there, and they asked us to help do some education, so we did some teaching. But we spent probably a good hour, hour and a half just standing up there and letting them ask us questions about America, what's America really like, and they would, it was very enlightening. It was very enlightening. So Marty and I have been to Africa before, right? We both live there. And this gentleman, who was a very nice man, he and his wife, so the kids were asking, well, what do you do in your free time? So here's this guy from Utah telling these African kids, well, we get all bundled up, and, and we put on these big boots, and we go out in the snow, and we ski. So we're laughing, because not only do these kids not know what boots are, yeah. 
I don't know how many kids shoes. are wearing shoes. Right. Never mind snow and bundled up and skiing. <laughs> so yeah, by the end of the trip, they were pretty happy that they had us who had had the African experience because um, it helped them see the things differently. It's all relative. Um, so yeah, they celebrated our visit and uh, gave us some gifts of cloth, which is, is pretty significant when those cloths probably cost a good, good amount of money. Um, and because Marty was given the key to the city or the chief of the village, he was given a chicken. They, they also <laughs> gave me an African name. This, this one, they, they gave me the name Baya. And I said, you'd think I'd learn, right? I said, what does that mean? <laughs> At least I asked before I left the village this time. That's right. And they said, oh, how to put it? Mm. What is it, the? Village elder. You're the wise one. You have all the white hair. Right. <laughs> so. But there were some really good projects there. Here's a, an agriculture that was developed here in the US of how to conserve some of that moisture in fields. So you use it a layered system which was really helpful um, to get some, some vegetable production. Uh, row cropping a little bit, using some of that uh, fertilization from the um, goat program, and really taking some water and making sure that they're using that as mo most efficiently as they can. But these villages in these areas are just dying for, for aquaculture. They would be perfect for um, sloping reservoir ponds and then systems of fish culture, not only for the water reuse, the agricultural irrigation, but also that secondary crop of fish production. But there were so many projects we saw, so many schools, clinics, these guys did great jobs, but there were also a lot of USAID projects that had come into the area, um, meant well, but didn't didn't teach people how to maintain them, didn't teach people how to actually make them work for them. Um, just a cistern at the top of a hill. Anybody know about water? Yeah. Doesn't really like going uphill. So they were dependent on pumps. Well, anytime you add anything that is required, any petrol or fuel or energy or anything, it's going to break down and it's not going to work. Is it that efficient? Well, somebody probably had some big grant for a big pump. But what happens is all the stuff laid defunct. Lots and lots of money. The piping, not taken care of or stolen because somebody needed a gutter for their own rainwater. So those are the kind of things that Marty had mentioned in earlier funding that, thank goodness, the government is getting away from and really working on those farmer-to-farmer -farmer and educational and food security issues. I mean, these little metal placards on all these little kids' stools, gift from the USAID. It's pretty sad. sad. What's really kind of a, a shame um, in, in what she's saying, here you see a hand pump. If the hand pump breaks, or we saw one of those cisterns that was sitting empty, and the kids weren't washing their hands, it's because the valve broke, or a moving part breaks. Again, it's that where everybody is an owner in it. Nobody takes care of it. Nobody's been trained how to take care of it. So all these things sit there dormant because nobody's been trained. Right. There were some good intentional ponds. Um, my preference is not to build a pond of rocks because they have a tendency to wash it out. We like to do it with clay and there's plenty of clay. You just have to separate it. Um, but unbelievable potential. But the potential for the most part is the human resource. The number one resource in all of the third world is the people. And bigger than that is the women. And that's where that empowerment's going to come from, I believe. If we invest in the people, then it will come. So we explained to them, gave them a model, showed them how instead of what they wanted to do, somebody had come in and told them they could dam the little creek that they had running through there that uh, seasonally dried out. But if they backed up enough water, then they would have water that they could carry up the hill to their plants. 
And we said, well, why don't you build a reservoir up on the hill, and then you can flow the water down. And so we showed them how they could build these reservoirs with fish ponds below so that they could go one from the other, and how that in times when they didn't have access to good drinking water, they could actually drink that water. Right. So there's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of those champion women who are ready to go, and there, hopefully there will be more of these volunteer projects that will be able to go and, and give good um, info that will help them live better lives and better nutritional food security. Um, so there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of uh, organizations. Again, one I would push is Aquaculture Without Frontiers, total nonprofit, um, that we can, we can continue on some of this work. And we look towards experts in other fields, too. Um, you're never too old to give your expertise. So think about that. There's a lot of opportunities there. And it's great travel. Because who's going to make the difference is all of us and all of you.